We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Jonathan Davis, economist, wealth advisor, and publisher of the Free Booms and Bust Report. Jonathan, how are you today? I'm very good, thanks. How are you, Tom? I'm excellent. It's good to speak with you again. And we're going to go over, you know, this broad theme of really, I think, inflation that you see for the for the coming time. We, we've really seen, let's say, the end of this disinflationary era that has really persisted for the last 40 years here. So maybe we can start by discussing a little bit about, let's say, the mechanics of why that era has ended. And maybe if you think that 2020, you know, really marks the end of that era, despite, you know, COVID really coming into play in that case or not. Yes. Um, So, first of all, the headline, we are in an era which some of us call financial repression. Financial repression, Mark I, was in fact um, after World War II until the late 1970s. Um, so the, the central bankers, the politicians, the bankers got together in 1946-47 uh, and were horrified at the amount of debt that had been taken on to have the war. <laughs> Thank God they did, because I know I wouldn't be here. Um, and they all agreed amongst themselves what was going to happen in order to get not the level of debt nominally down, but the the ratio of debt to GDP down. Mm-hmm. So the, the economy could continue to grow, but debt would grow um, less fast. Therefore, the ratio... And, and it's interesting because... In the late 40s, debt to GDP peaked at 150% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, it was 300%. And in fact... Just to interrupt you for a second there, Jonathan, is that for the US? Is that for the world? You know, what does that apply to for that nation? It's total debt in the developed world. Okay. Total non-financial debt. So mm-hmm. not, not the, the banking system, non-financial debt, corporate, government, and household. Mm-hmm. Okay. And indeed, um, you, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the C word there. Um, can I just make the point that that had absolutely nothing to do with the crash of early 2020? Um, it was the shenanigans in financial markets leading up to um, early 2020, they created the crash. The fact that they blamed it um, on a pretend virus is entirely up to them. Um, And that's what everyone believed um, because it was convenient. And that allowed them to lock up the economies um, and then bring in what, in fact, they decided to do in 2019. They had meetings just like In 1946, they realized that debt to GDP was far too high. It was unmanageable. They couldn't sustain the system that they had created over decades. So they decided to have financial repression number two. Now, before we look at number two, let's look at what you were talking about there. Um, The end of disinflation, falling inflation which, of course, the peak in inflation was the late 70s, early 80s, and inflation just fell, interest rates just fell, decade after decade, not in a straight line, of course, um, until literally uh, spring of 2020. Um, Okay, we'll we'll look at interest rates uh, in a moment. But let's just first of all go back to the 1970s 
where we had peak inflation. And, you know, 1946, 47, they didn't say, well, let, let's um, um, have financial repression in order to get debt to GDP down. And it happened overnight. Mm -hmm. No. What financial repression means, quite simply to you and me, is higher inflation. And it doesn't happen A, B, C, bum, bum, bum. In fact, through the 50s, inflation just ticked up. Then it got a bit steeper in the 60s until it went exponential in the 70s in the West. In the United Kingdom, where I am, um, consumer inflation peaked at 25%. Interest rates peaked at 15 to 20%. And um, total debt went down to just over 100% of GDP. It took them, what's that, 50, 60, 70, over 30 years to get debt to GDP down from 150 to just over 100%. It took them that long. And in the meanwhile, GDP rose, but inflation rose faster. Mm -hmm. Over time, these things don't happen overnight. And that is exactly what we are going to have now. For 40 years after inflation and interest rates peaked, they trended down until spring of 2020, we had zero inflation, zero interest rates, effectively. Mm -hmm. In many countries in the West, they had negative interest rates. Uh, in the US, the 10-year got down to 0.07%, 0.1% uh, in the UK. Um, and of course, base rates were effectively zero for 14, uh, 2008 to 2020, 12 years, beg your pardon. Zero interest rates. What a ridiculous concept. And um, why did we have zero interest rates? Because um, Bernanke and his mates decided to create this illegal mandate for the Fed of 2% inflation. Never had it been considered in the history of central banking, and certainly not since 1913. And all of a sudden, they decided to have this 2% inflation. The mandate of the Fed, of course, is um, um, uh, stable money. In other words, 0% inflation. But of course, the reason why they went for 2% is because they didn't want deflation. Now, you and I would love deflation because that means the cost of food is cheaper, the cost of energy, the cost of transportation, the costs of living and the costs of doing business would be lower. Thus, our standards of living would be higher. But it would screw the billionaires and the bankers. So that's why, A, they had to have inflation and B, they had to brainwash the Western world into believing that mild inflation is a good thing. It is not. Well, we're back to the stage now since 2019, 2020, when deflation or disinflation, falling inflation ended. And it ended in April of 2020, in that dramatic week when uh, the futures for oil went to minus $36 a barrel. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who could possibly suggest that that wasn't a multi-generational low in deflation, well, good luck to you because I'm convinced that it was. Mm -hmm. And of course, interestingly, over the next two years, oil went up to $130 a barrel. And how remarkable that they blame the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, when in fact um, the oil price rise happened before that conflict um, blew up. And yet they blame Ukraine and Russia. Ridiculous. Brainwashing is an interesting thing. Brainwashing by politicians and by, um, by the authorities. Mm -hmm. So um, that oil went to $130 was the beginning of two or three decades of high inflation. Now, I don't know about, about North America, but in the UK, um, from 1990 to 2020, 30 years, um, 
inflation for 28 of those years peaked at 3%. The other 2%, the other two years, it peaked at 5%. So we can reasonably say that for 30 years, a generation, inflation, consumer inflation was 0 to 5%. Now we should expect inflation for a generation to be 5 to 10%. The odd year, it'll be below five. The odd year, it'll be above 10. But reasonably, we'll say five to 10 for the next 20 years. So the rest of this decade, the 30s into the 40s. And it started three or four years ago. So that's about 25 years. And um, we should therefore also expect interest rates to be much higher than they've been for the last uh, 15 years. Um, um, from 2008-9 to 2022, was that 13, 14 years, we had 0% interest rates. Now, of course, they're 5, 5.5%. Five and, and even when the next recession comes, and by the way, I, I'm not expecting it for a couple of years now, even when the next recession comes, even if interest rates fall then, don't expect that they're going to fall back to the lows. Um, perhaps 2 or 3% at the bottom, mm -hmm. but I'll be surprised if they even fall that much. Because remember, the politicians, the central bankers and the bankers want inflation. And what they want, they get. So they will do whatever they need to do to keep that inflation there. And they'll also do things to not let it run rampant, uh, um, as in Zimbabwe or Argentina from recently, um, and so on. They will not want hyperinflation. They will want what I've termed superinflation, like the 1970s. Um, and to put it another way, they want to steal the money from um, um, asset holders and old people slowly so that they don't realize what's happening. But of course, inflation of five to 10% for five or 10 years means that your assets, unless it's invested properly, they're going to crash in value, not in nominal terms, but in real terms. So um, we are in an era of financial repression with the objective is to allow or to create the economy to grow nominally and inflation, eh, sorry, sorry, debt to rise more slowly than the rate of increase in the economy. Thus, the debt to GDP will fall. And uh, as I say, it's going to be another 20 years. That's where we are economically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think really important to remember the difference between that nominal yet and, and real rate of return, rate of inflation, rate of growth, I think, in the economy. So, you know, when you say that we're very likely not facing a recession here, does that end up, you know, basically being caused or that definition basically being, being caused, let's say the, the lack of recession being caused by that lack of real return, yet nominally, we're going to keep growing? Um, partly. Um, I, I'd be more specific than that. Um, the principal reasons, there are two principal reasons that I can think of as to why we're not heading to an imminent economic recession. Um, I, I'll, you know, uh, uh, cards on the table, um, I, I said in the first half of last year that mm -hmm. we were. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't happen. Um, and um, as Keynes said, when the facts change, I change my mind. Um, so what, in retrospect, stopped us having a global economy? Sorry, no, I, I need to caveat that. Mm -hmm. We had a globally, the US may not have, but globally, we had a mild economic recession last year. Certainly, um, inflation collapsed um, in America from June 22 to November 23. Uh, similarly, in the UK, we had a mild global economic recession last year, but it wasn't a hard one. That's what I expected. 
you know, interest rates going from zero to 5% in, in, in a nanosecond, basically 15 months, you'd have thought that that would create all sorts of problems. Well, uh, whatever they did, they made us get through the problems without a hard recession. And we're not going to have a recession in the immediate term now. Why? And this is the point. Um, borrowing, 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 spending, spending, spending. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think you might uh, enjoy this little anecdote from Britain um, in the 1970s. Um, there was a thing called the pools. Um, you could kind of think of it like um, like the lottery, um, where basically there were there were 50 um, major football matches. This is proper football, not the thing that you <laughs> call football, but proper football. Um, uh, and uh, you, you had to mark off. Um, which games were going to be the score draws, 1-1, one, 2-2, one, two, two, three, 3 and you'd get most points. And the one who got the most points won a million quid or whatever the numbers were mm-hmm. in those days. And there's a famous lady, I can't remember her name, who uh, on, the ca- on camera is, what are you going to do with the money? She said, I'm going to spend, spend, spend. And 10 years later, she was bankrupt. Um. There's, a, there's an apocryphal story there, uh, metaphor for governments, I'm sure, but I can't really think what that might be. However, governments, of course, can print whatever they want. Pools winners cannot, lottery winners cannot. Um, so we know that um, all Western companies, are uh, countries, are just spending like crazy, particularly America, 6% deficit, um, which is the largest in peacetime in history. And of course, they're doing it in order to try and keep um, the incumbents in the, the White House. Um, as ugly as that may be, but that's real politic. So, of course, when you've got that level of spending, um, um, that's going to um, uh, keep the economy spinning, uh, plate spinning. Also, you still had the, um, the handouts from 2020, 2021. They still went on until the middle of 2023, in their tens of billions a month. So, you know, you put those two things together, that's the reason why we didn't have a recession and why we're not going to have a recession. And then finally, um, um, you know, people talk about deglobalization. I actually believe it's more particularly de-Chinification. In other words, um, um, Manufacturing is being taken away from China and, as we say, reshoring to the West mm-hmm. and friendshoring to Indonesia, to Japan, indeed, to um, India, to Mexico. Um, th- these are not complex um, concepts, but this is what's happening. And indeed, in the last two years, I don't know if you've seen the chart. Um, if you want afterwards, I'll send you the charts. Remarkable. The amount of manufacturing, the amount of money spent on manufacturing bases in America has gone up, I think, 500 percent in order to bring manufacturing back to America from China. Mm -hmm. Now, naturally, when you've got that level of money, and of course, it's heavily subsidized again by the state. When you've got that level of money going into the system, it's not going to uh, create an economic recession when you've got all the other things going on. And uh, similarly, um, um, post the November election, um, I think the politicians are yet again like 2020, ju- uh, uh, 2021, I beg your pardon, they're going to open the spigots, as we say, and they're going to turn on the taps, another metaphor, and they're just going to hand money away uh, like confetti. And again, so not only are we going to see continued mildly rising economic growth since the end of last year, also mildly rising inflation since the end of last year, but they're actually going to pick up um, into the end of this year and they're going to be even stronger inflation and economic growth in 2025. And in fact, in that medium term, and I, and I think your your viewers should should look at the charts, uh, not my charts, but charts in general. Um, I think the second half of this year and 2025 are going to be very, very similar 
to the second half of 2020 and 2021 in markets, whether it's commodities, shares, bonds, whatever. Jonathan, you bring up this idea of de-Chinification, right? They really drove a, a good part of the last commodities boom, let's say, as their expansion of their manufacturing base took shape here. But how does that look as their economy kind of changes from, you know, manufacturing to somewhat consumer as well? And, and how does that end up affecting the global inflation picture? Um, I, I'm not sure, actually, that the dramatic increase in manufacturing over 30 years was what China um, 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 had that they did all those commodities. I think it was all the property development. Um, and today, I mean, this is one of the great problems that the second largest economy in the planet has. It's got 100 million homes which have been built, but which are unsold. 100 million? There's only 24 million homes in total in the United Kingdom. And we've got, what, 68 million people. So, you know, it's a disaster zone. Mm -hmm. So, as you say, they're moving away from property and manufacturing. Well, manufacturing, they have to because they got no option because the West is doing it for them. Uh, and they're moving to uh, electric vehicles, uh, semiconductors, and other um, high-tech, high-value, um, shall we say, modern um, a, 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 um, industries. And good luck to them. They have no option because um, they can't continue doing what they were doing. But um, um, although um, it was China that sucked in all those commodities and created a commodity uh, semi-super cycle, um, it doesn't change that those commodities are going to be needed, mm -hmm. whether they're um, um, used to buy electric vehicle, uh, build electric vehicles in, uh, in America, in Mexico, um, um, India, I mean, we hear all the time there's a billion Indians who haven't got air conditioning um, um, and uh, uh, they're, they're still buying gold and um, um, uh, nuclear power plants are being built all over the world. Uh, there's an enormous deficit of uh, uranium production uh, by the miners. So, you know, th there's still going to be a huge demand for commodities right across the commodity space. Um, it's not just about China. Um, on the contrary, um, over the next one or two generations, um, I, I think people will be astonished, um, in fact, how much everywhere else but China will need commodities. I, I, I think it will be a sight to behold. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get into that, but I'd like to spend a little bit more time on, let's say, the drivers of inflation and, and how we really separate all of these things. You know, you you mentioned earlier a little bit and also in your last booms and bust report, what does a global economy need to get things moving? Lending. Banks' lending standards are easing. So how does lending play into these drivers as well? Well, I, I, I would have thought, uh, what I'll, I'll cover that very quickly because everyone knows that if, if, if lending is relatively easy and people are indeed therefore borrowing, then they're investing. They're, uh, they're building homes which need uh, copper and, uh, and everything else. I'm not a builder. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I wrote in that booms and busts because um, um, uh, there's a housing bust going on right now uh, in most of the West, if not the entirety. I said, I'm, I'm not a builder but I believe you need bricks to build homes. Uh, and I showed a chart for the number of bricks which are being produced in Britain. They're at multi-decade lows. Um, and, and I'm sure that's uh, similar uh, across the Western world. So, you know, I, if we can, I'd love to talk about the housing bust, actually. I think that's quite mm -hmm. interesting. Um, um, uh, what, what was your question again? Oh, yeah, uh lending. Yeah, yeah, lending. Okay, so so lending people will borrow, they'll they'll invest, um, they'll they'll buy companies, they'll get things moving, um, and 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 that's why we need commodities. But but you know that that's that's not necessarily the reason why we're going to have a commodities semi or fully super cycle. 
we're, we're going to have inflation and a commodity super cycle because of the chicken and the egg, which mm -hmm. comes first. Um, the, you know, oil um, was, um, a, 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 during the trading hours, not the futures, oil was at zero um, four years ago. Um, it went up to 130, down to 60, 70, 80. Um, actually, and we'll come to this, I, I, I think it's, um, it's probably having a bit of a downturn right now. We'll talk about the next month or two in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when it bottoms for the next move up, the big mixed intermediate rally, which will be um, months to a couple of years, like 2020 to 2022, um, expect to see $200 oil. So in other words, um, a higher low, the first one is zero, the second one is 40 or 50 or 60, and uh, we got up to 130, we're going to get up to 200. Um, and that's just one commodity. Natural gas as well, um, um, copper, iron ore, um, agricultural produce, precious metals. It, there is, everyone knows, there has been a huge underinvestment in the production of commodities for decades. And, and, and to the deficits of production, we also have the year-by-year -year increases in demand. Um, I, I was just speaking to a client yesterday, and she asked me, um, but how will there be uh, more demand from oil? Because we're being told to buy electric vehicles. I said, I don't care what you're being told. There will be increased demand. Um, the, uh, the oil minister of Saudi Arabia um, says that there'll be an undersupply of oil of 5%, sorry, under binding of oil of 5% per annum for the next five to 10 years. And, and therefore, if you're not finding enough oil, there's only one thing that can happen. The price has to rise. Mm -hmm. now, I'm talking about, first of all, the next two or three years to $200. And then, of course, it will crash again. I don't know what. Say to 100, mm -hmm. say to 70 or whatever. But we are in a multi-year bull for energy. And indeed, uh, that, that's where um, we are having a lot of our money, my client's money, um, placed right now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get to that energy picture in a little bit, but I just want to finish kind of touching on this, this idea of real versus nominal returns and let's say the okay. optics of that. You know, okay. if we take, for example, the Dow, you know, being at all time highs, basically at this point, does that, does that, you know, major indice keep looking like it's returning and being an excellent investment in nominal right. terms, but we have to, you know, right. remember that we should be looking at it in real terms as well. Right, right. So, so two points: um, the Dow and the S and P, um, they're they're rather interchange uh, interchangeable as such. Um, the 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 they have attracted for many many years an outsize amount and proportion of global wealth, of global investing. And it's worked. There's no mm -hmm. question those investors have done very, very well. So this is where I ask you to turn to the first chart of those that I sent you. Um, the Dow Jones from the 1960s to the early 1980s. I talked, of course, about financial repression, Mark 1, and inflation really started to take off from the mid 60s, um, perfect, yep. Yeah. And of course, as everyone knows, it went into a crescendo inflation by the 1970s. Look at this remarkable chart for the Dow. The S&P is slightly different, but not much. Um, we, uh, we start there at the first peak in 1966 on the left, and on the right, uh, we go to 1982, where it broke the resistance. So just think about this. From the early 60s to the late 70s, we had 175% inflation, mm -hmm. and yet the Dow ended where it started in nominal terms, mm -hmm. which means that if you were a share investor in those two decades, 
you were annihilated. Um, so uh, it, and the S and P did go up, not much. It didn't go up anywhere remotely near um, uh, inflation. But I'm showing the Dow because it really emphasised that until the early 1980s, you didn't make much money by investing in anything. Bonds were annihilated by inflation. Shares didn't do much, and property didn't do much. Those are the main asset classes, obviously. And then from the early 1980s to 2020, we had a 40-year boom in all of those asset classes. Um, interest rates collapsed. Uh, collapsed. You can scroll up to the, the chart above. Um, there is a, a chart of the US 10-year, the government 10-year rate from the early 1980s, um, in fact, to today. Um, just focus on the channel, the downward channel. Mm -hmm. 40 years. Um, what is that? Uh, 1980. Um, no, 30 years to 2010, 2012, interest rates just fell. And in case viewers don't quite get this, when interest rates fall, bond prices rise. That is the um, negative correlation. Bond prices just rose for decades and then were essentially flat for the next decade till 2020. OK, there was a sharp dip down for a couple of years, but essentially they were basically flat for a decade. Bonds did fantastically well for 40 years. Everyone knows. Shares did fantastically well for 40 years. Everyone knows. Property did fantastically well for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Well, where are we now? Everything's reversed. Interest rates, A, are no longer falling. They can't. They can't go below zero. Well, for long. Um, they have risen the last few years. Um, can I just say, I'm not one of those who sees interest rates going through the stratosphere as in 20, 30, 50, 100 percent hyperinflation in the West maybe in some countries, mm -hmm. um, I rather expect them to peak at no more than around about 10%. And even that is in the next decade. Um, I, I, but they are trending up, no doubt. We're at uh, roughly 4.7% on the 10-year. We got down to effectively zero four years ago, which is, and I say, deflation or disinflation ended. Um, so... Um, if if over the next 20 years, bonds average between, um, shall we say, 5 and 10% interest rate, it means, therefore, there is no value in bonds long term. No doubt traders will be able to um, buy at very high interest rates. They'll come down a few percent and then they'll sell. As a long term investor, there's no value in bonds. Shares, I think shares, as in the S&P and the Dow, will do similarly to the Dow and the S&P in the 1960s and the 1970s. Property, um, at best, residential property will grow sub-inflation for the next 25 years, which, of course, is contrary to what we've experienced 40, 50 years. Property grew above inflation mm -hmm. for that time. Um, so those are the major asset classes that people invested in. Um, we should, of course, talk about uh, commodities. But um, the, 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 this is the big change. You know, I remember reading um, a, 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 a metaphor um, of uh, the old man reviewing his investment life. And he said, if only I'd invested in gold in the 1970s mm -hmm. and then sold it and bought shares, and then fell asleep for 40 years, and then come back to gold. Mm -hmm. Because that is essentially the big picture. It really is that simple. And, you know, I'm one of these guys who like to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when we look at the, you know, almost the, it's almost cheating to look at these long eras where we had falling interest rates, what that meant for gold, what that meant for shares, what that meant for bonds. And now, you know, seeing, let's say the end of that cycle, that trend breaking, 
looking at these hard assets again, these tangible goods, I think is obviously an excellent trade to be able to fall asleep to in a way. Yes, um, long term. Um, and just before we talk about that, one other thing has come into my mind, which I think is pertinent and worth saying. Mm -hmm. 2022 was a very interesting year. For four decades, whenever you had a stock market crash, interest rates would fall, bond prices would rise. So anyone invested in what they call a 60-40 portfolio, equities, bonds, although the proportions could be 70-30, 80-20, but they generically call it 60-40, mm -hmm. it worked. In big crash years, they didn't lose as much as they could have been if they were 100% in shares. 2022 was the first year in over four decades that shares went down and bonds went down. And that essentially confirmed it for me that the economic and markets world had altered long-term. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, I want to just stay on, let's say, the housing picture for a moment, if we can. You know, you mentioned that earlier. So what is so interesting about where the housing market is at this time, especially considering that interest rates have ticked up, but we really haven't seen, or maybe we're just starting to see the effects of those higher interest rates on Let's just let's just stay on the housing market and then we can separate the commercial real estate market for that. Um, it, it's kind of similar in in America, um, Canada uh, and Britain, um, and I'm sure therefore the the other um, um, Western countries, uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, um, because of the government spending, we haven't had a recession. Because of de-Chinification, we haven't had a recession. And people haven't lost their jobs, so there's still high employment, although um, um, a lot of people have gone to part-time employment. But even so, but they haven't been forced yet out of their houses because, um, um, of course, in America, they, they've got 3% mortgages, which they took out like Billio uh, in 21 and 22. Uh, and, in Amer and in Britain... Um, we don't have 30-year mortgages. We have um, two or three or five-year fixed rate mortgages. And they're still working through those fixed rates coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And then the rates doubling or trebling. Um, so, Canada's you know, facing it, the same thing. Yeah, indeed. It's the oil tanker. It takes a long time to turn around. But mm -hmm. I can tell you, um, in Britain, not in the official indices, but first of all, in terms of the number of house sales, they peaked two years ago. In terms of prices, actual sale transaction prices, they also peaked nearly two years ago. And they're only down a bit. They're only down 5 to 10%. But even that's hardly reflected in the indices. Why? And I'm going to guess that this is similar in North America. The indices are six to 12 months out of date. When you think about it, I mean, I don't, in, in our system, um, you agree a price and uh, then you go through the surveys and the legals and whatever, and you, you then you agree what they call an exchange of contracts date, where the buyer will make a 10% deposit. Um, and then a week or three later, um, you'll have what's called the completion date, the mortgage will kick in, any other funds needed will come in, the money's paid over, the title to the property is paid, is given over to the buyer. So that process can easily take a couple of months mm -hmm. to get from offer to completion. And then um, it doesn't get into any of the indices for another three or four months because um, it's just not recorded until later on. So there's a good five or six months before it gets into the, the, the bank indices. It's a good year before all the transactions get into the government indices. Um, and I'm sure there's a big time lag in North America as well. 
So um, we, we do see house price falls marginally, 5 to 10% in the official indices. They are going to speed up for the rest of this year because, of course, what we're going to see this year is what happened in the second half of last year mm-hmm. when more and more people were coming off their fixed rate mortgages and they had to sell. And remember, there's always the crowd who have to sell. The, um, the, de- the deaths, the divorces, and the displaced, the unemployed, they are the have to sells. They'll sell at any price. So if they have to take a 20% hit, they will. And that is coming into the system. And it's going to be the same in Canada and America uh, as it is in Britain. This year will be a bad year. Next year will be worse, particularly as people's severance pay falls to the wayside. Uh, you know, in, in San Francisco, they've been, they've been having six, nine months of severance pay. Mm-hmm. You know, again, all these things make a massive time lag for the economy and markets to actually see the, the actual changes. Yeah, the idea of these, you know, the long and varied lags, even as the Fed admits that they are, it's, it's always interesting to try to take those into account. And, you know, really these second and third order effects and how they play into all of these different, you know, fingers of the economy, if you will. On that topic, I'd like to get your take on, you know, this crash of commercial real estate and what that could mean for certain pension funds as well that hold REITs, that hold a lot of commercial real estate in their portfolios. Yeah. Um, I I know there are many commentators and indeed until a um, a few months, I was I was uh, uh, listening to them intently and, and nodding my head, saying it's going to crash the system. It's 2008 all over again. Mm-hmm. And of course, I get that point. But, you know, when when I hear and read other analysis um, such as, um, you know, um, in ABC Inc. has seven floors of a skyscraper and... Um, um, realizes that it actually now for, with their uh, working from home and part-time work and, 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 they only need three floors. Um, they were paying a million dollars a year. They're still paying a million dollars a year, but you know what? They've sublet two or three of the floors that they're not using. Okay, they're not getting half a million dollars sublet rent. They might be getting half of what they're paying, but my point is, They've laid off some of the risk, some of the costs. So, you know, businesses, um, it, it's, two years since, it's two years since interest rates started soaring. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we see every other week this skyscraper in, in um, Denver or in San Francisco or in Manhattan is being sold 20 cents in the dollar. I totally get that. But, you know, the, the system just has a way of working through these things, and particularly entrepreneurs have, if only the government and the the bankers, uh, the central bankers would get out of the way. So, you know, we do have a way of filtering, of getting through this. Um, Yes, it will be problematic, and I think primarily it'll be problematic for private equity, um, which, of course, has been um, kicking the can down the line for the last 18 months, and, you know, they're very clever guys, these private equity guys. They didn't get to where they are without being smart. They will continue, whether by hook or by crook, they will kick the can down the line. Um, as I say, um, you know, I said I don't see a recession for the next couple of years. I really don't, particularly because of the election this, uh, later this year and the turning on of the taps next year. Um, that's why the earliest I could see a recession would be 2026 and mm-hmm. probably not even then. But commercial will be a toast still for another few years. And residential has been extremely difficult. The number of um, lived in homes, sorry, the number of homes newly built for sale has crashed Um and that, of course, is filtering through to the developers uh, and, and therefore will filter through to the economy. 
uh, house prices will visibly be falling this year and next year and perhaps 2026. So put all that together, then I can envisage a recession. But then again, we don't know what the politicians will do in a right. couple of years' time. Mm -hmm. So, Jonathan, let's let's focus on what is going going to appreciate in this environment coming up, right? We touched on a little bit of energy. We touched on, you know, somewhat, let's say, a quote unquote super cycle for commodities. Where are you focusing? You know, where you're investing, and why is that? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, um, until a month ago, we were um, 80% in a mixture of gold and silver miners, um, global mid-cap energy, and uranium miners, with about 15% in cash and a few percent in other. Today, I've sold practically everything apart from the uranium. So today we are 60% in cash um, and still heavily in, in uranium, not 40%, uh, I hasten to say. We've got, but heavily in uranium. I would have sold uranium miners, but for the fact that since 2022 to the summer of last year, uranium crashed and burned. If you could just focus on the last couple of years. Yep. So um, in orange there, we've got um, a UK fund of miners, very similar to the Sprott Fund um, or the, um, what, what, what's the other one? Is it Han ETF, I think it is? Uh, no, that is Sprott. Um, Glo Global X, I think it is. They're very similar to, to URN, um, whatever the, the so the, um, that's what the orange is there. Mm -hmm. And if you look in 2022, it peaked and then absolutely crashed um, into the summer of 2023. Um, so crashed and rose and crashed um, and has been and has risen for the last several months from the summer of last year and has pulled back a bit in the last couple of months. My point being, I, I'm expecting since a few weeks ago into the rest, into May and possibly into June, for there to be a general S&P stocks crash. Now, that crash um, could be 15 to 25%. And actually, I think that is likely. So that's the level that I'm talking. Somewhat similar to the short, sharp crash of March of 2020. It could be 40%. I don't expect it. But I am expecting a 15 to 25% short, sharp shock to the system. I think the system is very concerned about strongly rising long-term interest rates. Uh, and if you look at Meta, Facebook, you look at Alphabet, Google, look at Tesla, look at Apple, you know, the darlings, um, are their share prices are falling. Mm -hmm. And they led the market up, and I believe that they are leading the market down. Literally last week and this week, we see um, a mild support because of the Fed meeting tomorrow. But I believe that literally from next week, perhaps this Friday, I think the market is going to fall through May and perhaps through June. And um, it's going to spill over to um, heavily traded commodities such as oil and gold and silver. Um, and um, the margin call clerk will come a calling. Mm -hmm. So that's why those commodities will fall. That's what I expect. However, I didn't come out of uranium because it already fell, as it were. And I just don't know if it's going to fall again. Mm -hmm. And I was comfortable if I'm going to go 60% in cash, I'm happy to be 40% invested through um, a likely crash. Mm -hmm. After that, oh my goodness, I'm rubbing my hands. In June or perhaps the first or so week of July, this is what I mean by what I said earlier. I think it's going to be like the last week of March, first week of April, 
2020, when um, miners and gold and silver bottomed and ready for a big blast off. Um, a few weeks later, oil bottomed, ready for a big blast off and right across the commodities sector. So um, we will be going back in based upon what I see just now. Um, if the facts change, I'll change my mind, but mm -hmm. I'm expecting uh, by the end of May, by the end of June, to be fully invested 90% in commodities and specifically in uranium, gold and silver miners and um, global um, energy. We will also have um, an exposure to global, shall we say, normal stock market, global small to mid cap. Um, because um, I said earlier, and everyone knows that the S&P and the Dow have raked in vast amounts to global wealth for 10 years. I think that over the next few years, that's going to reverse. So I'm putting a sizable amount of our money into global small mid cap outside of both the US and China. So how do you see, you know, you said you came out of gold miners as well, Jonathan. Yep. What, what do you think explains that underperformance from the miners? Or is it just an anticipation of the margin call and that search for liquidity anywhere? Yeah, no, no. Um, I just simply think that um, three months ago, no, no, six months ago, when gold apparently bottomed and had risen strongly since, um, and of course, silver and miners follows what gold does. It looked as if three months ago or two and a half months ago that this was it. This was 2020. This was 2016. And gold was going to the moon and the miners and silver were going to the stars. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think they have been stopped in their tracks by the same expectation that I have that there's about to be a short, sharp shock to global financial markets. And uh, I think the smart money has uh, has made good money. I mean, uh, juniors went up 50, 60% in a nanosecond. Um, so of course those traders um, will have taken the money and run, but the longer term guys who are smart, um, who are general markets participants, who also get into miners, they'll be saying, no, no, I see a problem here. And bearing in mind the longer situation, I mean, look at that chart. It's a fascinating chart. I love this chart. 2016, the bottom, the end of 2015 was the bottom of the four and a half year crash in precious metals. Mm -hmm. And in six months, miners went up, juniors went up 200%. And then over the next three and a half years, gave it all back. And, uh, and from the end of March, the end of the crash in 2020, for the next five months, juniors went up 200% and then gave it practically all back. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're not making any money. The, the, particularly the juniors, um, I don't know what the, the, the management and the directors do, but they don't make money. All you have to do is look at their accounts. But there is an opportunity from time to time to, um, as investors or speculators, to really mint it with juniors. Now, yes, you can get into uh, Newmont um, and, and just hold for the long term, uh, and they will be far less volatile, both up and down, than the juniors. But uh, I perceive that um, we will have a month or two, perhaps, of falling miners. Here we are talking on the 30th of April. Um, uh, juniors are down 3% today. I don't think that's any surprise. Gold's down to 1310. We might even see it in the 1200s today. Um, silver is about to breach $26. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember a month ago when I, we were told, oh, it's on the way to 50. Well, that was, by the way, exactly the time when I was getting out 
back mm-hmm. out of our juniors. Um, we don't. We haven't been investing in gold and silver. We've only been uh, speculating in juniors. Um, so I believe that juniors will come back from the peak uh, recently, a week or two back, um, 20 or 30 percent, kind of similar to um, March 2020. Um, and then I expect they're going to go up anywhere between 100 and 300 percent in around six months. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm expecting just now. Very similar to 20 and 16. And then I'm getting out. How about we go over your outlook for oil as well, Jonathan? You know, you yep. you you mentioned that earlier as well. I think, yeah, that's yep. the that's the chart here. So yep. you know, is that is that a can can we draw you know basic trend lines around that inflationary impulse in the world and what that means for what that ends up meaning for the price of oil as well? Yep. So it's a chart from 2008 to today. We see the $150 or so in 2008, which largely created the recession then. Um, And of course, interest rates rose to meet the inflation challenge uh, in 2007 and 2008. We then had um, 12 years of uh, falling energy costs. It was a 10 year uh, crash Um, to what I said earlier, effectively oil went to zero. Oil is now in a multi-year, 10 year at least, bull market, but nothing goes in a straight line. We're currently around, uh, what, uh, $75, $80 a barrel. I think actually it's going to be um, uh, cut um, in the next month or two, just as I say, everything's going to be cut. Um, um, I think we're going to go back to that uh, lower blue horizontal, which is uh, the 60s to 70s. Mm -hmm. We might even go below that into the 50s, as strange as that may sound. That's going to bring what is the orange line, which is an index of energy stocks, all the way down, uh, I expect, along with um, share prices generally. But again, what a fantastic opportunity, because it will be like spring 20 to spring 22. So from whether it's 45 or 55 or $65 and energy stocks come down 15 to 30%, which is what I expect over the next few or several weeks, buy with both hands because um, look at my blue arrow there. Um, unfortunately, my chart doesn't go above $150. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, over the next couple of years, three, perhaps four years, we'll see $200. We're just not producing enough of the thing for the growth in the economy that's coming because they're going to be opening the spigots globally, mm-hmm. not just in America and Britain. We also have an election, but of course, it's really immaterial. Um, yes, um, it's a it's a commodities, energy, agriculture, precious metals, um, um, uh, um, industrial metals, super cycle. We just haven't been producing or uh, finding enough of all of these things for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And yet the demand continues to rise. Um, $200. um, Just imagine what that's going to do to filling up um, people's tanks. Um, And that's the kind of thing, um, heating your home, the air conditioning. This is the kind of thing that creates recessions. And... um, we're going to have, as I say, it's going to be very similar. Go back up to the Dow Jones, which actually tells us about inflation, uh, recessions and growth periods. Mm-hmm. Each time the market crashed, it was a recession, and then we had a bull period. Inflation came back, we had a recession, and everything crashed. And whereas for 40 years... Um, from 1980 to 2020, we'd have, shall we say, a few to several years up and then a couple of years down. So the cycle was, shall we say, nearly 10 years. The cycle that we now have is much shorter. We'll have a couple of years up and a year or two down mm-hmm. um, in markets. 
I, I'm not quite sure about economics, but that's what I perceive in markets. And that has pretty well been the case since 2020. And yeah. I think if you su superimpose the charts of 2020 to now onto that chart, they're looking there, you'll see it's broadly similar. Mm -hmm. And that volatility that is coming is due to this push and pull of the debt and credit contraction and expansion cycles within the economy, right? It, it, it's the desire by the central bankers, the bankers and the politicians to have inflation. It, it, it's the borrowing and spending, and it's the de-Chinification. Mm -hmm. So put it all together, you've got inflation for another 20 years, but you don't have the same asset growth that you had for decades. You have different asset growth. As I say, chicken or egg, inflation mm -hmm. or commodities. Yeah, and just to go back to the commodities chart, as you were saying in oil, that your chart doesn't go up that high. This is, you know, a great illustration of how you expect this to play out for commodities as well. Indeed, and most people know the CRB. I prefer this one because the CRB is, I think, forty percent oil, whereas this is an equal weighted chart across the 18 top commodities. So I think this is a more representative chart of what has actually happened. Clearly, we had very low inflation or deflation for some 15 years. Um, and of course, in the last few years, we've seen inflation come back in the last couple of years. So we've had disinflation for the last couple of years. But that's part of the ongoing trend which started four years ago of multi-year, potentially multi-decade inflation, nothing goes in a straight line. So expect oil and copper and iron and food and clothing and transportation and probably precious metal to rise for years and years. In fact, can we talk about gold now? Mm -hmm. Um, so gold, short term, I, I can see gold going below 2200 and possibly to the breakout level at 2100. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking small beer. If you can buy gold or precious metals sub 2200 on a medium term view, you'll do exceptionally well. But, you know, let's just say for simplicity, mm -hmm. simple arithmetic, mental arithmetic, it's 2500. I think for sure it's going to go to 3,000, 2,700 to 3,000 this year. And I am convinced that we are now in a super cycle for precious metals. And I think we have to. Um, I think the word I've written down, it's likely to go to $5,000 within five years. That, of course, is roughly 100%. Mm -hmm. And by anyone's books, anything which goes up 100% in five years has done very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're not talking Warren Buffett or one of the other um, uh, legendary investors, but, you know, 14, 15% per annum when inflation will be lower than that is a good deal. Because remember, the objective is to beat inflation. That's the primary objective. $5,000 within five years there's a possibility it could be $10,000. So what I'm saying to my investors is between 100 and 300% for gold itself. Silver, let's say for simplicity, it's $25. 50 is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. It'll go, you know, it'll go back to the all-time highs of uh, 13 years ago. $100 is likely so silver, I expect to go up at least $300 in the next five to 10 years. And because it is the hair to gold's tortoise, I think actually there will be a crazy couple of months like 2011 when silver could get up to anywhere between $250 and $500. So buying at $25 and basically just holding 
particularly physical, because then you're not inclined to get um, afraid and sell. Just hold the thing. What, what is it the modern young men and women say? Hodl the thing. Hodl gold and silver for the next five to ten years, and you'll be delighted that you did. Like the man who just bought it and held it and then sold it in 1980. Um, the juniors, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to buy them in a month or two and hold them just for six months or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will diversify into something else, including, no doubt, gold and some silver. But that's what I expect for um, uh, precious metals. The, 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 uh, the large, the global um, miners um, are probably more interesting. I probably put them in the same camp as silver in the sense that I might have a small holding of uh, global miners for the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really sounds like it's a, you know, this all encompassing market for the metals. Jonathan, how do you see the fact that China has been buying so aggressively and, and much of the East has been buying gold so aggressively, how do you see that playing out over this next, you know, five to 10 years as well? Yeah, well, you know, we, we've had the narrative of um, major countries um, building their stockpiles of gold for years and years, mm -hmm. but it hasn't really delivered anything in the gold price. Um, and I think the main reason for that is because it's a financialized sector now. Um, the GLDs of the world, SLVs, um, it, it's in the financial system. It, it's not like the old system where, you know, going back to 1963 and the Bond movie Goldfinger, when gold was the thing to own. Mm -hmm. um, it will be the thing to own, but I don't believe, I mean, the, the, I th forget belief. It seems to me my analysis is that all of that country buying of gold doesn't seem to affect the price of gold, silver, and miners. So I think it's a it's a it's a failed narrative, as it were. Perhaps it will be an issue um, in the next five to ten years, but that's not what I'm focused on at all. That mm -hmm. that's the gold narrative, and it simply has has uh, has not played out. Well, you know, how do you how do you separate this maybe price setting takeover by Shanghai, by the Shanghai physical exchange? And, you know, do you think that that ends up being a positive for the gold industry and gold price overall if they're taking that much gold from the West and let's say reducing yeah. that pricing power of London over over the physical asset? Gold, as you know, is a $12 trillion market. Um, um, Hong Kong and, and China, or should I say just China, um, is not buying a trillion dollars of gold. Hmm. Um, it will have a minor effect, but not, not the one that I think you're inferring. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Jonathan, it's so funny that you brought up that quote that you also put in the last, the last report the one from Keynes when he says, when the facts change, I change my mind. I think that is something that is very important in times like these and being able to objectively step back from what is happening in the world and changing our understanding of, you know, anytime the Fed sees panic, they're going to cut and, you know, expecting this Fed put, I think this landscape has dramatically changed. And I really appreciate you know you explaining how you have changed your mind in looking at a lot of these a lot of these situations. Yeah, um, as I said last year, um, I, I was very much in the in the bear camp. Um, I was a deflationista. Um, I, I saw the U.S. ten year going to sub two percent and potentially one percent, um, but in November of last year. Inflation stopped falling and it rose a tad. And in December, it rose a tad. In January, it rose a tad. Well, eventually you got to wake up and smell the roses. 
Mm -hmm. So that's one um, example of why I came out of government bonds and moved heavily into the commodity space. The fact that I'm out of the commodity space largely just now and happily in cash um, is something just because of something I've seen in the short to medium term uh, charts. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's going to be a short term crash is maybe too strong. It may not be too strong, but I, I think there's going to be materially lower prices um, four to eight weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. Excellent, Jonathan. Well, I, again, I, I really appreciate you sharing your analysis and your charts with us today. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave our listeners with to think about? Um, um, I, I, I want, I'm just looking at my notes, see if there's anything. Um, uranium. Um, we haven't talked enough about uranium. Um, um, in summary, I'll just I'll just put the headline out there. Um, whatever happens in the ultra short term to uranium in the general markets, mm -hmm. um, I think um, uranium uranium itself is going to treble, quadruple, quintuple, quintuple, and I think uranium miners are going to do do the same over the next two or three years. There's a lot more of what we've had since um, uh, March, April of 2020, still to come. I, I, I love, um, um, uh, someone says, someone in FinTwit says, I love what he says, it's fantastic. The only people invested in, uh, in uranium are 100 assholes on Twitter. I just absolutely love that statement because it's absolutely true. Um, when the world wakes up to the uranium opportunity, um, well, that will be the last icing on the cake. In the meanwhile, um, I and my clients will have made another couple hundred percent over the next year or two. Mm -hmm. Do you expect this okay. this next cycle to be as as violent and as as peaky and as quick as that last high in in uranium, or or is it is it um, a, likely going to be a more sustainable bull market because of the lessons learned? Well, hopefully? well look, look at the relative numbers. Um, uranium was just was slightly under twenty dollars in early twenty. Um, it um, it um, it has recently been up to $105. It pulled back to $85. It's in the high 80s now. It's interesting that the buyers came in at the low 80s. Um, I can certainly see $200 um, uranium by some time next year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that that will put a rocket ship under the miners. Um, and similar to silver, there's going to become a, oh my God moment, for the utilities, the nuclear power stations, um, they're going to phone their brokers and say, I need half a million pounds. And the guy's going to say, well, sure, it's yours, but um, I'm going to have to really pay through the nose for it. Not a problem. What, are you going to pay 120, 130? Yeah, double it and we'll talk. Mm -hmm. How much? But they have to pay it. They have literally zero option. Um, you know, I want on my headstone, um, um, at some point in the next hundred years when I die, um, when there's no option, there's only one option. That's so it. they're going to have to pay whatever it is. It's going to be like silver. It's going to be three, four, five hundred dollars for a couple of months. Um, and then the whole market will fall apart. Mm -hmm. Well, Jonathan, in, I... in a few years time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about how how we end up, let's say, being able to exit some of these positions and how these markets react when really the the momentum chasers really come in. And and well, hopefully, you know, we have both been a part of helping educate people to recognize those times. I think when you when you really feel you know, start to feel that conviction, oh man, I was right, I'm a genius, that's when it's time to be cautious. Correct. And equally correct, people must not be too greedy. Mm -hmm. Always sell too early. If it worked for um, Nathan Mayer Rothschild, then it can work for you and me. Mm -hmm. So for those that want more of Jonathan's research, um, the Boom's Bus Report, excellent. About every two months, I believe you release it. That's yeah, available. And it's free. 
Mm -hmm. It's free to anyone who um, who uh, subscribes on the website, jonathandaviswm.com. Um, if you don't like it, unsubscribe. But if mm -hmm. you do like it, then it's free. You'll get it in your inbox. I will never junk mail anyone. Also, um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I don't like to use his the, his new name for it. I I'm an old, I'm from the old school. Um, it, it's Twitter, um, and uh, I'm Jonathan Davis, where the O is a zero. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Jonathan. Right. I really appreciate your time today and and walking us through your ideas here. My great pleasure. All the very best. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. You too. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.